Good morning, this is David Bennett, and this is Bitcoin And, a podcast where I try to find the edge effect between the worlds of Bitcoin, gaming, permaculture, podcasting, and education to gain a better understanding of all. Edge effect is a concept from ecology describing a greater diversity of life where the edges of two systems overlap. While species from either system can be found at the edge, it is important to note there are species in the overlap that exist in neither system, and that is what I seek to uncover. So join me in discovering the variety of things being created as Bitcoin rubs up against other systems. It is 5.45 a.m. Central Daylight Time. Only thieves and oil men, and apparently me, are up at this time of morning. It's the 21st of September 2021. This is episode 480 of Bitcoin, and of course it's September. Of course. I keep forgetting about September and Bitcoin. (laughs) September and Bitcoin have an interesting relationship. Bitcoin doesn't like September. It has a tendency to go down. Number go down technology brought to you by the month of September. (laughs) Fuck you, September. I can't stand your ass. Um. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, September is actually kind of kind of really weird for me as well. It, it's filled with good news as well as as bad news as far as birthdays, wedding anniversaries, anniversaries of you know, family members who have died. Um, and it's it's a it's actually a bizarre month for me. And I kind of wonder though, is it a bizarre month for you? Even just not with the whole, you know, number go down technology initiating in September. Is there anything going on in September in your life where you're like, ah, man, there's a lot of stuff going on, good and bad or just bad or just good. I mean, is is September packed to the gills for you like it is for me? That's that's my question because I just, I just wonder <laughs> at this point about the month. So, yeah, as you can... Uh, As you've probably noticed as of yesterday, we've got a pretty good drop going on. Um, And typically we see this in Bitcoin in September and I kind of keep forgetting about it, but this one, um, I think this is being fueled by Evergrande news, which we will get into. It's also being fueled by September itself, uh, which we won't get into. Well, we may, I I may have something about September up here. I'm not sure yet. Um. There's an entire, it's not, and it's not just Evergrande because Evergrande news is breaking at the same time that all this pandemic stuff is coming to a head. You got Australia freaking out and the people there, the actual, you know, the citizenry, the people that actually matter and not the governmental institutions uh, are just starting to push back. I have seen several videos this morning already of mass amounts of people just going after the cops and the cops having to run away. Ladies and gentlemen, this does not look good. And on top of all this, we've got Evergrande. And does Evergrande have exposure? Or or rather, what's the exposure of global institutions to Evergrande? Because I've heard everything from a whole shit ton of exposure, which at the, you know has crossed the Rubicon over into just flat financial contagion, like we saw in 2008, all the way to the other side of the story, which says that China will be able to contain it within the Chinese borders, and it will suck for them, but it will not suck for the global economy. Take, take your pick, guys. Take your pick. You know, which one is it going to be? So <clears throat> here's a theory. The pandemic was started, basically came out of China as far as most of us, you know, if we have our memories about us, then we remember the flopping around of individuals on the floor, freaking out and drooling and then just dying on the spot. We saw a lot of videos out of Wuhan and China and in general and like a whole bunch of them. You don't see them anymore, but they were scary as fuck, right? Remember that? And that was, I can't even remember when that was, 18 months ago, it was like May or some, or uh, beginning of January of 2020 or something. I can't remember at this point. Anyway, and now all of a sudden, we've got the entire world's governments locking down citizenry 
And I wonder, okay, I'm not putting the tinfoil hat on. It's okay to theorize without going full-blown conspiracy theory, but I cannot help but to wonder if they knew this shit was going to happen with Evergrande and a whole bunch of other Chinese real estate development that have been building ghost cities for the last, you know what, 25 years, and they really ramped it up 10 years ago. <clears throat> I wonder if it's possible that all of the people that have exposure to Evergrande are a lot more people than we actually know about, that there's a lot more of them than we think or being told, and that the entire pandemic and the whole notion of a financial quote-unquote reset was basically to get people ready for a complete and total financial implosion, the likes of which make 2008 look like a practice run, which maybe it was. I don't know. I'm not going to get any further into, into conspiracy theory about that shit. Let's just say it's not beyond the realm of possibility. All right, let's get started with all this stuff, bro. <clears throat> oh, before I begin, please, uh, call for help from Bitcoin and uh, have gotten, like yesterday's call for help, worked very, very well. A lot of people, I mean, I saw like my, the, the listen numbers on the podcast shot straight up. I've got people that are retweeting my, retweeting the show announcements. I, it's just, it's wonderful to see that so many people came out and started, you know, have, well, those that have always supported the show are always going to, you know, have always supported the show. And, and y'all have always stepped up to, to, up to the plate, and I, I thank you for that. But a lot of new people started doing it too, and I can't thank you enough. And if you'd continue for today and the rest of the week, um, man, I, you know, it's, it's really heartwarming to see this. But we must get into Chivo. It's Chivo. It's so cool. 1.6 million Salvadorans are now using the Bitcoin Chivo wallet. I don't know. I always heard the old saying, uh, you know, don't trust, verify, right? So Bitcoin Magazine is going to tell us about it. And Nick Hoffman is writing it. Today, the president of El Salvador, uh, uh, Nayib Bukele, tweeted out an update on the adoption progress of the nation's recently launched Bitcoin app, the Chivo wallet, <clears throat> as of now. Over 1.6 million Salvadorans have been onboarded to the app and now have access to the corn. And here's Nayib Bukele's tweet. It says, 1.6 millones de Salvadoreños se ha utilizan Chivo Wallet y subiendo. Hashtag Bitcoin. Ha ha. The adoption of Bitcoin in El Salvador is ramping up quickly. As just this past Friday, September the 17th, 2021, the president reported 1.1 million Salvadorans being onboarded to the app. These numbers are impressive considering Bitcoin only became legal tender in the country on September the 7th. Before adopting a Bitcoin standard, 70% of the active population in El Salvador was unbanked. But now, Bitcoin has changed global financial geopolitics forever. Uh, well, that's true. That's definitely true. Uh, Bitcoin is banking the unbanked, and now over 1.6 million El Salvadorans have access to a savings account via Bitcoin. And this is absolutely massive, considering the population of the small country is about 6.5 million meaning almost 25% of the population in El Salvador is now banked. Despite the FUD that mainstream media has tried attacking Bitcoin in El Salvador with this past month, the country is poised to take advantage of all the benefits operating on a Bitcoin standard provides. President Bukele has stood his ground against the IMF and the World Bank in his decision to make Bitcoin legal tender. El Salvador is setting a great example for other countries to follow in adopting Bitcoin and its citizenry are going to benefit from it in the long and the short term. All right, Nick, all I can say is how do we know? And Hey, I'm not spreading FUD, okay? I just, I got to get back to my roots. How do we know that 1.6 million Salvadorans are now onboarded to the Chivo wallet? <coughs> Don't trust. Verify. How can we verify this? 
Ask yourself that question. Just because President Bukele comes out and says, hey, man, 1.6 million Salvadorans are, are, now, uh, are now banked with Bitcoin via the Chivo app. I don't know. How do we know? Just because you download it, it doesn't mean you use it, right? So I can't use that number. I, I guess I could take a survey, but I mean, I don't know if that's going to work. Plus, I'm not going to be able to go to, down to El Salvador anytime soon. You know, I got a family, dude. And plus, the Salvador has got those freaking vaccine passports like stupid other countries do. And that's just disheartening. I'm just saying, if you have, if there's anybody out there that has real intelligence, like if somebody from Bitcoin Beach is listening, please help verify in whatever way you can that the 1.6 million Salvadorans onboarded to the Chivo app is actually correct and truthful. Otherwise, it's just a president saying, hey, look at what I did. Okay, now, <clears throat> continuing on with a little bit more El Salvadoran news, we're going to bust 10 myths about El Salvador and Bitcoin out of Bitcoin Magazine being written by Jeffrey Tucker. El Salvador's adoption of Bitcoin as legal tender received a tremendous amount of international media attention. This attention has been welcomed a change from 10 years of Bitcoin obituaries and claims of Ponzi schemes and the like, but even so... There are myths out there about El Salvador's momentous new law that deserve busting. The first myth, the citizens of El Salvador are not sophisticated enough to use Bitcoin. I'm going to pause right there and just say, that's pretty racist. <laughs> anyway, continuing, this is complete rot. The wallet that the government commissioned to handle trading crashed in the first hours of its launch, not because it was broken, but because it became too popular too fast for the app stores to keep up. The government offered $30 in BTC just for the download, and that caught on very quickly. Salvadorans are highly sophisticated at dealing with multiple currencies and exchange rates, toggling between official and gray market rates, and will adapt quickly. In this, they are far more sophisticated than the typical American who believes that the Canadian dollar is somehow mispriced. <laughs> Myth two, Bitcoin is too volatile to be a good currency. Maybe that line worked five years ago, but anyone can look at the price charts and therefore the long run trajectory. This currency has been declared dead hundreds of times and it keeps not dying. On the contrary, it is widely seen as a deflationary token, which is to say that it grows in value relative to the goods and services it purchases. That could be the biggest experiment of all, what a deflationary currency does for a nation's economy and culture. We've not really seen this since the late 19th century when it was widely expected that a sound currency grows more valuable over time. My prediction is that it will do very well incentivizing savings and encouraging investment. Myth three, Bitcoin can't compete with standard remittance technology. Well, this again is completely incorrect. Western Union is slow, expensive, and embeds lots of counterparty risk. Bitcoin is relatively fast and cheap and has no counterparty risk. The transactions are not reversible without the use of an intermediary. This will become incredibly obvious very quickly as people outside of the country raid Bitcoin ATMs to convert dollars to Bitcoin in order to transfer them very quickly and easily to friends and family. Myth four. There is no way this will catch on. My prediction is that it will catch on very quickly. Most heads of state will be thrilled with the Salvadoran President Nayib Bukele's 80% approval rating, which is only going to rise further if this goes well. That he took the risk of doing this, defying money masters of the world, only adds to his popularity within the country. Oh, and by the way, contrary to what the U.S. media is starting to say, Bukele is not a dictator because he wants another term. This has to be the most ridiculous claim to date. Okay, we're going to pause on that one right there. That's a matter of opinion. Okay? I don't know what I actually think about Bukele because I've never hung out with the man. I've never had Mexican beers, you know, with him on the beach. All right. I've, I've never hung out and had dinner with him and his wife. I guess he's married. I don't know anything about the man because I've never sat in the person's presence. And you can't, you can't come up with anything about anybody anywhere in the world if I mean, you, you can't figure out who they are unless you sit down with them. All we get is media stuff. I do think he's got an authoritarian bent. He walked into Congress with, with, you know, with army personnel that had firearms. 
Right? That's not a good sign. From what I understand about this, you know, getting a second term, he was, you know, I heard that he changed the Constitution in a way, I don't know. See, that's the thing. It's hard to tell what the truth actually is. Again, don't trust, verify. Myth five, Bitcoin fell after El Salvador adopted it. This claim was made in the U.S. media, and I had to check my eyesight. It turns out that overnight, Bitcoin bumped up against 53000 and fell back to 51000 after the price the day before of 49000 There was some profit-taking, some pulling back, but hardly a crash. You can call that down if you want to, but guess what? This is how Bitcoin behaves, and it's hardly surprising. People in the sector know how to regard a price dip as an opportunity. Americans think it is not possible to do rational accounting under these conditions, but just watch. This poor nation is about to teach the world how to do it. Six, the president is merely playing to a geek crowd. Ah, oh, this too is nonsense. President Bukele had the wisdom to seek out informed opinion and followed it. In this, he defied the usual pattern, which is for heads of state to reply on the masters, or rather, yeah, well, well, no, on the masters of international <clears throat> central banking who know almost nothing about the new world of money. In fact, they are presiding over the destruction of the dollar as we speak. The people who advise the president in this case are not powerful. They have something else, intelligence. That's a real rare thing in the world of statecraft these days. Seven, El Salvador will become the world center of money laundering. Oh God. <laughs> Again, this is total myth. The most laundered currency today is the United States dollar, not Bitcoin. With four in five workers in El Salvador working in the informal sector, and with only one third having bank accounts, the problem of money laundering will get better and not worse. <clears throat> Keep in mind that Bitcoin is not an anonymous currency, it is pseudonymous which is to say you can track it easily, but not necessarily know the identity of the sender and the receiver. Number eight, if this experiment flops, Bitcoin is doomed. I happen not to believe that the experiment will flop. Indeed, this is the perfect country in which to try the first full experiment in legal tendering a cryptocurrency token. I fully expect copycat countries to pop up in the region and then around the world, but if that doesn't happen, the advantages of this technology over national currency are so strong and so obvious that it will continue to make advances regardless of how things go in El Salvador. Number nine, none of this matters. Bunk, it matters a great deal. The world's leading purveyors of fiat currency have been shaking in their tassel loafers for 10 years over the meaning and implications of cryptocurrency. They have done their best to put it down and keep it down, but it hasn't worked. If the dollar really does head further down the inflationary rabbit hole, there will be nothing to stop this industry from achieving even newer heights. My prediction is that within the next 10 years, it will be conventional for private currencies to circulate alongside national currencies, and no one will think much about it. And the final myth, it's just money. This is wrong too. Cryptocurrency is a ledger technology to mark and secure ownership rights, and this has huge implications for contracts, law, and every form of smart technology. It raises the possibility of financial and economics uh, without reliance on unreliable governments and court systems. It forms the basis of a new way of doing business that reduces risk and vastly increases security of property rights. We can see this gradually unfolding in the cryptocurrency clearing system, it works far better than central banks. For years, cryptocurrency enthusiasts have said that the United States could adopt Bitcoin as a replacement for the dollar. I doubt it, but we'll see. The U.S. did everything possible to wreck the dollar over the last 18 months. There is a genuine precedent for dramatic monetary reform in the United States, and it could happen again, especially if there is rising anger at the Federal Reserve in the wake of galloping inflation. The reform could happen even without approval from the top. And in the meantime, all eyes are on El Salvador, especially from other countries with unbanked populations that rely heavily on remittances. Wouldn't it be something if this poor, forgotten nation pointed the way toward a global revolution in money? We shall see. <clears throat> Thank you, Jeffrey Tucker, for that one. However, I will say this. As you know, if you've been listening to the show for any length of time, I am more interested in Central, South America, and Africa, and a few other uh, places on the globe for exactly this reason. 
the remittance reason, the fact that they've been in poverty for so fucking long that we can't even count the years, and they have largely been forgotten. How the hell can you actually look <clears throat> at the a map of the Western Hemisphere from Canada all the way down to the you know to the tip of Chile in South America? Look at that and then understand that Mexico is pretty much the and Brazil is pretty much the only non third world countries in the entire in that entire place. How can you actually look at that and go how, and not ask yourself how the how the hell did this happen? It is a huge part of the world that we forgot about. We're not going to forget them very soon. They're going to wake up. They are going to wake up just like just like when the when the Japanese emperor ordered the the hit on Pearl Harbor and I can't I think it was Gen Admiral Yakamoto or it was either him or one of the other guys told the emperor that if you do this, if we go out there, if we steam out into the Pacific and we launch our planes and we bomb the naval base at Pearl Harbor, you're going to awaken a dragon that has been sleeping. That is what's going on right fucking now in Central and South America. There is a dragon that has been sleeping and they are starting to wake up. And it's going to be hell on wheels when they do. And I am very glad that I've got enough years left on my life to see the full implications of that shit unfold. It's going to be exciting if you will let it be exciting. You don't have to sit there and go, oh my God, what will it do to geopolitics? Who gives a fuck what it does to geopolitics? Do you like geopolitics right now? Do you like the way the world looks? Then it's going to have to change. And that may mean a lot of people, a lot of big countries lose their seat at the table in the future. And honestly, I honestly don't care. I just, at this point, I am so desperate for a change in the world that I would welcome the majority of the Western countries that have held sway in the world for so long to literally lose their affluence lose the ability for their opinion to actually matter, and all of them lose their seat at the table, get kicked out of the party, and go hungry while they're crying outside like a little bitty baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, <clears throat> let's move on. Crypto market loses $250 billion as Evergrande fears mount. So we're going to switch over to another side of the world here. Cryptocurrencies dipped lower on Monday in a broad sell-off. Many analysts attribute to growing concerns over China Evergrande Group's debt crisis and contagion fears. Cryptocurrency market capitalizations fell below $1.9 trillion on Monday morning, according to data from CoinMarketCap. Following a relatively positive weekend for digital assets, Bitcoin fell below 45000 and Ethereum has lost about 9% over the past 24 hours. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry, this is BlockWorks. And uh, Casey Wagner is writing it. Quote, this weekend, we saw a couple of alternative layer ones hit new all-time highs, specifically Avalanche and Cosmos. Sorry, guys. I do think that there's a fair bit of profit taking. At least that's kind of what we're seeing at our desk, said Joshua Lim, head of derivative trading at Genesis. Quote, a lot of folks are taking risks off the table specifically because of this Evergrande news. And it helps that these names have outperformed a lot coming into this, end quote. Yeah, whatever. Mark Yusko, founder, chief investment officer, and managing director of Morgan Creek Capital Management, shared his insight on a recent On the Margin podcast with BlockWorks co-founder Mike Ipiloito. Sorry if I butchered your name there, dude. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, stocks globally were trading lower on Monday with the Dow Jones Industrial Index and the S&P 500 both down about 1.5% at the time of publication. Other Chinese real estate developers such as Henderson Land Development Company slipped as well. It is a correlation similar to the situation in March 2020, experts said, when the COVID crisis was the driver of the markets. Quote, Traditional markets right now are selling off, and all the correlations you typically see when the market is fixated on one event or one risk have come to light again, said Rashun Patel, vice president of Genesis. Quote, the Evergrande situation, whether it's warranted or not, has the entire market fixated on this one thing and the fallout from it, end quote. 
Evergrande's potential impact on the digital asset space is indicative of crypto status as an asset class, uh, Lim said. Quote, my personal view is to the extent that crypto has become much more of a macro integrated asset, a lot of people now treat it as just another risk bucket in their broader portfolio. The correlations on these sorts of macro events are going to be higher, he said. <coughs> Evergrande's debt load stands somewhere north of $300 billion, and they have bond payments to the tune of $83.5 million due on September the 23rd on notes due in the first quarter of 2022. The company has 30 days from the scheduled payment date to pay or the bond defaults. The world is waiting to see how the Chinese government will respond and whether a bailout is on the table. The rescue of China Huangang uh, Asset Management Company announced August 18th was a tumultuous affair, which Bloomberg News called a culmination of months of bureaucratic infighting, ego flexing, and buck passing. Evergrande shares were down 10% at the time of publication. All right. Well, there's a lot more than there's a lot more uh, development companies in China that are feeling uh, some pretty scary times right now. There was at least three different ones that I saw. They've only mentioned one in this particular piece, but there were three other ones that were pretty much probably going to fail. So they are probably all interconnected and they probably all hold each other's paper and they're all probably going to go down. Will China be able to bail them out? I don't know. I mean, why, why the fuck not? Just print the money. I mean, apparently that's all you have to do is just turn, you know, make money, print or go burr, everything be fine. So whatever, but let's move on. We have, hold on. Sorry about that. Uh, infrastructure bill seeks to obligate people to report Bitcoin payments of over $10,000 to the IRS. This is out of Bitcoin Magazine, Namcios is writing it. According to publication 1544 of the Internal Revenue Service, any person who receives more than $10,000 in cash in 12 months due to a trade or business must report it to the IRS and the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network on Form 8300. However, the new infrastructure bill aims to extend that requirement to Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies at large. If enacted, this legislation will require any U.S. person receiving over $10,000 in cryptocurrency to report the sender's personal information, including social security number, to the authorities. I'm going to stop right there. Come, come on. What, dude, really? Really? Report it on what? What, what new form do we have? I mean, are we going to, you know, are you just going to throw, like, you know, the, the hot dog vendor on the street that you know, got a massive tip? I don't, it, it could happen. It, it, there's, this has happened. Okay. What's, what's he going to, how, I mean, like, honestly, they were bitching about the, the sophistication of El Salvadorans in one of the other pieces of, that we read. Now, how about the sophistication of the man on the street in the United States? How sophisticated is that dude? I mean, it's just, come on. I don't think this is going to work the way they think this is going to work. The current demands are elicited by section 6050I and contemplate a reporting requirement for cash transactions above $10,000 received in a trade or business. Late, incomplete, inaccurate, or missing reports all result in penalties. Civil penalties for that section, which start at $25,000, can be imposed before a day in court. In contrast, willful violations of these reporting requirements in Section 6050I entail maximum imprisonment of five years. Quote, drug dealers and smugglers often use large cash payments to launder money from illegal activities. The government can often trace this laundered money through the payments you report. Your compliance with these laws provide valuable information that can stop those who evade taxes and those who profit from the drug trade and other criminal activities. Publication 1544 said regarding the reason why these reporting requirements exist. Something that can often be neglected by such reasoning is the nature of illegal payments. People conducting illicit transactions either by selling drugs or conducting other criminal activities are the ones less likely to abide by these rules in the first damn place. And even though the receiver is responsible for reporting, hardly ever will someone engage in trade with criminals if they aren't performing criminal activities themselves. Additionally, as Michael Corver, Chief Digital Currency Advisor to the Director of FinCEN, recently shared in a Department of Justice journal, quote, as mainstream adoption of cryptocurrency has grown, the percentage of transactions used to promote or conceal crime has also decreased, end quote. But regardless of the disputed merits of surveillance to stop or prevent criminal activity, these reporting requirements are often difficult or impossible to abide by 
in the context of Bitcoin transactions, pseudonymous by nature, Bitcoin is also permissionless and peers in the network do not have the necessary information to provide the IRS and to the FinCEN. And even if they did, the probable consequences of such additions to the bill could be harsh. The privacy and thus the security of regular Americans would be at risk. To a certain extent, those requirements are similar to know your customer procedures used throughout the financial system. Third parties, usually financial intermediaries, often collect extensive amounts of data from their users to comply with the law. However, the long-term effectiveness and downstream consequences of these tactics are rarely discussed. KYC and similar strategies, more often than not, don't deliver on their promises and end up increasing the attack surface for every single individual. Furthermore, the extent to which the infrastructure bill seeks to regulate Bitcoin and cryptocurrency transactions might backlash because, faced with the impossibility of reporting, people and businesses might be pushed away from engaging in such trades in the United States altogether, ultimately risking the country's current leadership status in technology and finance. Innovation will naturally gravitate towards the places that will welcome it most. Enter Central and South America, the entire continent of Africa, the Baltics, the Balkans, and the majority of way far Eastern Europe. Those are the people that I give a shit about. Not that I don't give a shit about people in the West. I'm just saying that I think we've, I think we've lost the plot here in the West. Let's run the numbers. CNBC <clears throat> futures and commodities. Commodities doing uh, fairly well, including shiny metal rocks. Uh, West Texas Intermediate oil is up 1.04% to $71.02 a barrel. Brent North Sea likewise up the exact same amount to $74.69 a barrel. Natural gas has dipped below five bucks per thousand cubic feet. It's down almost, well, actually it's down 0.4% to $4.96. Uh, gasoline has risen by 0.6%, $2.12 per gallon. Gold up to $1,767. Silver is up, oh wow, a, a point and a half, $22.50. Platinum up a full two points. Copper is up a one point. And palladium, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> four percentage points to $1,938. <clears throat> Agricultural futures are mixed, but mostly to the upside with chocolate or cocoa coming up being the winter winner at 1.27% to the upside. We've got Dow futures up almost a full point. S&P futures are up 0.79%. NASDAQ futures up the exact same. S&P mini up almost a full point. So there's going to be some short-term recovery as to the bloodbath that was the markets yesterday. Let's talk about real money at $43,451, bitches. 273,000 transactions performed in the last 24 hours is 11,400 transactions per hour. 1.2, oh yay, 1.2 million BTC. Finally broke past that 1 million, that 1 million BTC mark. 1.26 million BTC sent in the last 24 hours. That's 52,622 BTC every hour on the hour being sent with an average transaction value of 4.64 BTC and the median transaction value of 0 0.018 BTC or 760 bucks. Block times are nine minutes and 56 seconds. So real close to the 10 minute mark with 0.1 BTC being taken in fees on a per block basis and 15 BTC being taken in fees overall in the last 24 hours. With a 7% drop in hash rate, we are down to 142.3 exahashes per second. And your shitcoin indicator as always is Dogecoin, standing at 21.3 US pennies. That's right, 21.3 United States pennies, and it ain't worth one of them. Now, 2,812 transactions are waiting on three blocks to clear. We have a market cap of $816.5 billion, representing 7.06% of gold's total market cap. And we can now only buy 24.5 ounces of a shiny metal rock with our one Bitcoin, of which there are 18 million. 822,104 BTC in circulation at this time. 
2,586 and a half of those are locked up in the Lightning Network at a capacity value of $112.2 million, being run over 15,471 nodes and uh, representing 71,402 payment channels that we know about. That's always a caveat, guys. 75.1% of the Lightning Network is being run over Tor. That means that 1,941.5 BTC are represented in the Tor side of the Lightning Network, running over 10,075 Tor nodes. That's going to do it for Vitals. Welcome to part two of the news you can use. This one out of digesttime.com. We are in a war against Bitcoin, says Turkey's President Erdogan. Oh. <laughs> I just find that so funny. Yes, this is a little older and you've probably already heard it before. I think this came out Thursday or something like that. But um, according to Bloomberg HT, the statement came from the president when asked by a participant at the event whether the central bank was interested in opening uh, for cryptocurrencies. More than confirming the lack of interest, Erdogan said he is in a war against cryptocurrencies and is fighting to destroy them. Oh yes, you're, you're the man of the people, pal. The controversial statement came just days after a Turkish central bank launched a collaborative platform to study the issuance of a central bank digital currency, the digital Turkish lira cuck buck. <clears throat> the bank said, it has completed CBDCs, proof of concept stage, and has moved on to the next stage of testing with the participation of several technology companies such as Acelin and Havislon, in addition to Tubitak Science and Technology Center. The results of the testing phase are expected to be announced next year when the BC will decide whether or not to issue the digital Turkish Lyra the Turkish president's declaration of war on Bitcoin is not a surprise since the beginning of the year, the country has been preventing the advance of the crypto market. In April, the government banned Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies from being used to make payments in the country. Uh, at the time, the central bank defended... Uh, oh, shit. <laughs> Sorry. At the time, the central bank defended the measure, saying that the ban was necessary because crypto actives quote, were not subject to any regulation and supervision mechanism of a central authority. <laughs> Citing possible irreparable damages and other risks with transactions involving digital assets back in May. Regulators published a decree that tightened the rules that exchanges should follow the, the operate or the operations in the country, forcing all companies in the sector to follow the same security guidelines as traditional banks. At the same time, the interest of the Turkish population in Bitcoin only grows in the country that suffers the devaluation of its national currency. When President Erdogan fired the central bank president in March, sending the Turkish lira plummeting against the dollar. Google searches for the term Bitcoin soared across the country. Yeah. What do you think the Turkish president is, is going to be able to do here? Nothing. Honestly, nothing. And guess what? On the flip side of that, we have our own U.S. congressmen who are not exactly against Bitcoin. Congressional Bitcoin believers, writes Jameson Lopp for BTC Times. In June 2018, the House Ethics Committee passed new rules requiring members to disclose their ownership of crypto asset holdings worth more than $1,000 in annual reports, giving them the same treatment as any other asset. While the financial filings for representatives, senators, and executive branch officials are all available online, actually combing through the asset reported takes a fair amount of manual labor I haven't had time to search through the disclosures of all 535 congressional members. Thus, I have focused on the most likely Bitcoin hodlers, those who have been <clears throat> publicly associated with the ecosystem. So why does it matter? I believe that this is a signal that is far stronger than any words a politician could ever speak. Clearly, we would expect that any Congress member who is publicly negative about Bitcoin 
would not own any, though it would be an interesting signal of hypocrisy if it turned out that they do hold on to some. On the other hand, we can truly believe, or can we truly believe, that a given politician who portrays Bitcoin positively is speaking truthfully if they don't believe in it enough to own any? Along the same vein, can we believe that they actually understand the technology if they haven't ever used it? The constituents of any elected official should certainly prefer that someone who makes laws about a given subject should have a strong understanding of it. The first congressman to disclose ownership of Bitcoin actually did so before the disclosure rules were passed. Representative Bob Goodlatte of Virginia owned between $1,000 and $15,000 worth of Bitcoin according to his annual financial disclosure for the year of 2017. And this is somewhat unsurprising given that his son was an early investor in Coinbase. Ooh, ah. let's just move on past that one. Given that his total reported assets appear to be in the $2 million to $6 million range, that would mean his Bitcoin constituted 0.02% to two, two uh, sorry, 0.02% to 0.75% of his net worth at the time. However, Good Latte's time in Congress ended in 2019. And when it comes to currently seated members of Congress who reported owning Bitcoin, I've only found two thus far. Senator Cynthia Lummis reported owning $100,000 to $250,000 of Bitcoin in 2020, given that her total reported assets are valued between 3.6 and 16.4 million. That means Bitcoin makes up between 0.6 and 2.75% of her net worth. Oh, good Lord. I accidentally clicked on the wrong thing. Sorry, guys. Let me get back to my spot. Do, 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 do. Also, Senator Pat Toomey reported purchasing zero or God, I'm having a hell of a time on the second part of the news. One thousand and fifteen thousand dollars of GBTC. That's the Grayscale Trust in June 2021. Based on his 2020 annual re- annual report, his total reported assets are valued between two point two and eight million dollars making a GBTC between 0.01% and 0.7% of his net worth. Now, on to Bitcoin campaign contributions. In 2014, the Federal Elections Commissions ruled that Bitcoins are money uh, or anything of value within the meaning of the act and thus may be received and held by campaign. Every congressman running for re-election in 2020 received $50 worth of Bitcoin donated to their campaign by the Chamber of Digital Commerce's Political Action Committee But who went to the trouble of accepting Bitcoin prior to this? Jared Paulus did not declare owning Bitcoin in 2018. I found this surprising because he was the first federal candidate to accept it back in 2014 after the FEC's ruling. Though he does have an enormous portfolio valued at over $400 million and could easily have indirect exposure through other investments and or trusts. Rand Paul reported no Bitcoin in 2020 despite being the first presidential candidate to accept donations. Representative Tom Emmer, one of the four co-chairs of the Congressional Blockchain Caucus, accepted Bitcoin but reported owning none in 2020. Uh, Representative Eric Sawell, also a member of the Congressional Blockchain Caucus, accepted Bitcoin for his presidential campaign and yet reported owning none in 2020. Quote, the Congressional Blockchain Caucus was founded in the 114th Congress and is a bipartisan group of members of Congress and staff who believe in the future of blockchain technology and understand that Congress has a role to play in its development. No, you don't. As a caucus, we have decided it on a hands-off regulatory approach, believing that this technology will best evolve the same way the internet did on its own. Okay, that I agree with. You'd think this group would have a reasonably high amount of Bitcoin holders, right? Ted Budd is the co-sponsor of several crypto bills, yet he reported no Bitcoin owned in 2020. Warren Davidson surprisingly reported no Bitcoin in 2020, despite briefly switching his Twitter avatar to have laser eyes. He is the co-sponsor of several crypto bills. Tom Emmer sponsored the Blockchain Regulatory Certainty Act and is the co-sponsor of at least one other crypto bill, and he reported owning no Bitcoin in 2020. He certainly seems to be pro-Bitcoin. Tom Emmer's tweet states, Bitcoin isn't the problem. Centralized control is. End of tweet. Ro Khanna reported none in 2020. He is the co-sponsor of several crypto bills. Darren Soto reported none in 2020. He authored two crypto bills. Eric Sawwell, as previously mentioned, reported none in 2020. None of the other 25 plus members of this caucus have recently reported owning Bitcoin either. 
Senator Cynthia Loomis co-founded this caucus, and as mentioned previously, she reported owning a, 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 an amount of Bitcoin. However, none of the five other members of the caucus can claim to have skin in the game. I have found various media mentions of these politicians speaking about cryptocurrency or blockchain technology over the years, so I checked their disclosures. Anna S. Show reported no Bitcoin in 2020. Bill Foster, the same. Trey Hollingsworth, the same. Senator John Kennedy, the same. Thomas Massey has made strong pro-Bitcoin statements over the years. He seems to have a strong libertarian views, yet he reported owning no Bitcoin in 2020. Catherine Cortez Masto, who has previously made positive statements about the space, has no Bitcoin. Patrick McHenry reported owning no Bitcoin. Senator Todd Young reported owning none in 2020. Senator Mark Warner reported no Bitcoin ownership in 2020. These results are disappointing for Bitcoin enthusiasts anyway, to say the least. Are these politicians LARPing or did they simply forget that they required, were required to report crypto assets? Federal ethics rules require transparency, yet this information is not easily digestible as I believe it should be. Due to the size of the data set that needs to be checked, this project seems like a good candidate for crowdsourcing. And if you're interested in learning more and potentially contributing to the effort, check out the project I've started at bitcoinpoliticians.org by Jameson Lopp. That is bitcoinpoliticians.org by Janus, Jameson Lopp. I want to go back up and I want to, ask, I want to make sure that we have this hit this correct. Um, Talking about the Bitcoin campaign contributions, when you said all the Jared Paulus and Rand Paul and Tom Emmer and all those people that they had taken Bitcoin for their contributions for their campaign, but reported owning none. I don't think that is quite as bad as Jameson makes it out to be because the campaign is what owns the cryptocurrency and they can't give it to the politician. Now I know what Jameson is trying to say that, you know, if you're going to, you know, accept Bitcoin for your campaign contributions, then then you as the candidate should probably own some too. I just want to make it clear that just because a campaign accepted donations, does there is a clear delineation as to what the, the candidate can and cannot do with campaign contribution money. That isn't to say that chicanery does not happen. This is clear. I'm just saying that I'm not surprised that they don't hold any Bitcoin simply because they took it as campaign contributions because there is a firewall between the candidate's personal assets and the campaign's assets. Just wanna be clear about that. Now, let's see. Oh, good God almighty, here we go again. DeFi. DeFi platform V Finance is, has been exploited for $35 million on Avalanche blockchain. <sighs> NGMI motherfuckers, Cointelegraph, Helen Parts, decentralized finance platform V Finance reported 35 million in losses in its latest exploit just a few days after launching the mainnet on the Avalanche network and after pausing services due to suspicious activity on September the 20th, V Finance confirmed that its platform was under attack, using, uh, resulting in a loss of 8,800 Ethereum or Ether and around 214 Bitcoin. The total amount is worth more than 35 million at the time of writing. According to the official incident announcement, the suspected attacker has collected, collected stolen assets on one address after exploiting the V Finance trade contract address. In order to prevent further losses, the V Finance team suspended the platform's contracts alongside deposits and borrowing functions. <clears throat> v Finance did not elaborate on the specifics and possible causes behind this latest exploit at the time of publication. Quote, the V team is actively working to further clarify the incident and will continue to try to contact the attacker to recover the assets. We are taking and handling this incident seriously and will do our best to protect the interest of V Finance users, the announcement noted. V Finance is a DeFi lending program or platform focused on supporting multiple mining mechanisms, including liquidity mining, transaction mining, and leveraged mining. The platform officially launched its mainnet on Avalanche September the 14th alongside a liquidity mining launch. After integrating Chainlink price feeds as an Oracle network solution, V Finance broke 300 million in total value locked on its platform on September the 19th. 
The latest incident comes amid the increasing number of exploits targeting the Avalanche, a DeFi-focused blockchain protocol launched in September of 2020. Last week, the Avalanche-based DeFi application Zabu Finance was exploited for $3.2 million, causing the value of Zabu tokens plummet to zero. Avalanche's native token, Avex, has been hitting new all-time highs recently, probably because people are just fucking stupid, with its price surpassing $75 on September the 18th, according to data from CoinMarketCap. At the time of writing, Avex is trading at $61.79, down about 3% over the past 24 hours. So yet another DeFi exploit. Why do people keep doing this? Not a, I mean, I know why they're exploiting shit because there's shit to exploit. That's, that's the people that I'm talking about is why do you keep putting money into this? You're just going to lose your money. And like, like I, it's just every single week I see one or two stories about a DeFi platform that gets exploited Usually during, uh, use, use, usually using flash loans to violate or somehow or another exploit a bug in a contract because these contracts are not audited, they're not tested, they're just thrown out onto the fucking chain. People buy it because it's the next big thing, and then they lose their money because there's just somebody waiting in the background going, "I already know how to exploit the contract. I'm just waiting on a chance to pull the trigger." Stop doing this to yourself and stop telling other people about DeFi. You are not doing them any good. You will lose friendships out of it. Trust me. Coinbase drops planned lending program after an SEC warning. This is Coindesk and it's being written by Nate DiCamillo. Coinbase is no longer launching its crypto lending product, the company said on Friday. In September, the exchange's CEO, Brian Mulrat Armstrong, announced that U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission had told Coinbase that it would sue the exchange if it launched the product dubbed Lend. Coinbase later quietly updated a June blog post to announce we are not launching the USDC APY program as announced. The lending product was supposed to power a crypto savings account that would earn customers a 4% annual annual percentage yield, a return that's multiple higher than most savings accounts at traditional banks. The SEC said Lend would violate longstanding securities regulations pointing to U.S. Supreme Court case including Howie and Reeves. Coinbase chief legal officer Paul Grell wrote in a blog post. I'm going to come back to that one. Coinbase's decision also comes on the heels of state securities regulators issuing warnings to crypto lending platforms BlockFi and Celsius claiming these companies' products violate state securities laws. A Coinbase spokesperson referred Coindesk to the June blog post when reached for comment. A coin, <clears throat> Coinbase shares were trading down almost 5% to $233.32 on Monday afternoon with the wider slump in crypto prices. Bitcoin and Ether are both down roughly 8% over the last 24 hours. Okay, let's go back to this, this, this statement here. The SEC said Lend would violate longstanding securities regulations pointing to U.S. Supreme Court cases, including Howie and Reeves, said the chief legal officer, Paul Gruel, the chief legal officer for Coinbase. How, the, how is it that you hire a legal team that cannot figure out that your product violates the Howey test. Think about that. I mean, honestly, take a deep breath and think about something as big and has as much money as Coinbase and they can't put together a legal team that says, no, dude, this is going to violate Howey. On the flip side of that, I could see that they were going to launch it anyway and know full well that they were going to violate the Howey test just to see if the SEC was going to say anything. And if that's the case, uh, it kind of makes me smile a little bit, but I hate Coinbase because Coinbase hates Bitcoin. And if you don't know why, I, I kind of can't help you here. Now, meet the taco plebs from Bitcoin Magazine. Casey Carrillo is writing about it. For addicts and debt slaves. Bitcoin is a bright light in a dark place. A former drug and alcohol addict discusses our addiction to fiat money, debt slavery, and how Bitcoin expires him for the future. Now, this is basically a a podcast episode of Meet the Taco Plebs, but there's a pretty good write-up of what happened in that episode and some questions that were asked and answers that were given. So let's read through them. 
although the general general sentiment of the Bitcoin community is that of Bitcoin magazine is of hope and optimism, the real world is often not so straightforward. One of our recent posts discussed the reality of addiction and how this relates to the fiat world and debt. I believe that this is an important topic that touches nearly everyone with drug and alcohol addiction widespread in the United States. Almost everyone knows a friend or family member impacted. Addiction can also be found in a way in our fiat monetary system and the debt cycle it proliferates. Otter BTC, a former drug and alcohol addict himself, and I discussed both of these topics on the podcast, so be sure to give it a listen. So here's the first question. What's your rabbit hole story? Okay, the answer. I was fully introduced to Bitcoin during the mania of the bull run late in 2017. I bought a little coin, then watched the price fall into the bear market of 2018, and at some point I wanted to know more. I started trying to find content in the space where I could learn. I remember listening to podcasts with Tim Ferriss, Naval Ravikant, and Nick Zabo, and then another where Winston Cesaris was interviewed. I fell down the rabbit hole hard. I felt like a veil was being lifted from my eyes. I had previously been interested in gold and silver coins as valuable collectibles, but this was different. The implications of widespread Bitcoin adoption as a benefit to every person on the planet has kept me enamored ever since. How has Bitcoin changed your life? Well, I'm more hopeful and optimistic for the future today because of Bitcoin. Even in all of the chaos around us, I still tend to have a glimmer in my eye knowing that Bitcoin exists and that there are advocates everywhere and more people being enlightened every moment. I always intuitively believe that centralized control over anything valuable, money, goods, services, or even humans themselves, was the cause of much oppression in the world. But I never dug deep enough to understand the mechanisms behind how this control was wielded and it all starts with money. My eyes are more open today. I take even more responsibility for my reaction to life today and I absolutely prefer to verify before trusting in what any person or institution puts forth as fact. Show me the incentives. Question, your recent piece on addiction, fiat, debt, and Bitcoin is really interesting. Could you discuss some of the parallels you see between those things and what led you to write the article? As I lay out in the article, our global economy is addicted to cheap fiat debt in an unsustainable way. The consequences cause huge, distor huge distortions in markets that have rippling effects across society. Much of the populace acts with the objective of fulfilling high time preference goals. We are ever in fear that the prices of things will, will, will go up. Therefore, we must get them now so we take on debt to acquire such things. Being in debt can be perceived as another form of slavery. Being underneath debt can feel like getting on a hamster wheel inside of a cage where you stay active, but do not realize your main objective is only to service the liability that you've been saddled with. This is a soul-sucking endeavor and leads to the degradation of the individual. I was once enslaved to drugs and alcohol. It's a desperate and demoralizing place to be. At many points, I was only living to service the spell of the addiction that I was under. I had a moment of grace and took the opportunity to change my life, which I'll forever be grateful for. In writing the article, I wanted to share a bit of my story and give back and contribute a perspective to the community. Societal ills affect us all. Misinformation around money and the negative effects of debt seem to be shrouded in ignorance similarly to the way we as a society address drug, drug and alcohol addiction and its associated stigma. I'd love to help shed light on both. What are you looking forward to in the Bitcoin space? Now, I'm looking forward to more widespread adoption and education. Millions more light bulb moments. I want more people to feel their minds being blown away as they interact with Bitcoin, send their first transaction, watch their savings increase over time. I'm looking forward to seeing people place more value on their time and in turn spend that time with their families and doing what they love. So what's your price prediction for the end of 2021 and the end of 2030? Well, I'd say we see $100,000 before January 2022. I'm purposely being bearish so as to not have any dashed expectations and an easy 1.5 million Bitcoin price by 2030. So there you go. All right, man. You know what? I think we're going to go ahead and end it there. That's going to do it for the morning roundup. You know what I haven't done in a long, long time is a train wrecked.
Your Daily Train Wreck, brought to you by Decrypt.co. Solana blames denial of service attack for last week's downtime. <laughs> Yeah, they're coming up with excuses for the Solana thing now saying it's a DDoS. And I'm sorry, it doesn't really matter. If your shit chain is going to get DDoS, then you don't need to have anything to do with it. All right, so let's move on. Dad says jokes. Someone replaced all of the buttons on the elevator. It was wrong on so many levels. Yes, sir. We're coming to the end. We are now past one hour. That is the mark of the end. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. I appreciate your time. Uh, I, ho <clears throat> I hope that these uh, hour-long shows Monday through Friday give you the news that you can use. I really do. So that you don't have to figure out what the hell's going on on your morning commute. Uh, I'd appreciate your help supporting the show, uh, Streamy Satoshis off of the Breeze Wallet or any of the other podcasting 2.0 apps. I am thinking very seriously about getting a Patreon account. I would rather not because it deals in fiat, but I really want to push this thing forward and I need your help to do that. And if you can't, you know, if you can't support the show monetarily, your time is is even more valuable. And if you retweet uh, some of the show tweets that I put out uh, announcing the show, that helps. Five-star reviews on Apple iTunes always helps. Tell your friends, your family, hey, look, if you want to get the morning news on your way to work and you don't want to read about Bitcoin, you just want to hear it while you're looking at something else, then hit up Bitcoin and I will see you on the other side. This has been Bitcoin and... And I'm your host, David Bennett. I hope you enjoyed today's episode and hope to see you again real soon. Have a great day. <laughs>